Today I'd like to talk about false teaching and how it is, uh, how it's a very serious thing when it works its way into the church uh, or the people of God. Jude warns about this. The book of Jude, the book before Revelations in uh, most Bibles, it warns about this. Uh, and I'm going to read from Jude 1 and uh, chapter 1. Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt compelled to write to urge you to contend for the faith that was once of all, once for all entrusted to God's holy people. For certain individuals whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are ungodly people who pervert the grace of God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign Lord. Now, that is very jam-packed in and of itself. We could probably do a broadcast over that 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 piece of scripture entirely. Uh, but I'm going to focus on a few elements of what kind of uh, false teachers oftentimes reflect in according to scripture. See, we see... Uh, one element is they pervert the grace of our Lord, our, our God, into a license for immorality. Now, a lot of people have heard of uh, the uh, heard of people who use their salvation or their faith, or say, or like use the faith as an example to just live however you want. That's not how God has called us to live through Jesus Christ. We are called to repent of our sins turn away from our sins and follow Jesus Christ. But you, we see here in this passage of Jude, there's, there would be false teachers who would pervert that gospel and make it into a license for immorality. Meaning, uh, basically, you can sin all you want. You're covered by grace. And that is a false teaching. That is truly a false teaching. In Romans 6, Paul says, Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. And Paul talks extensively about how we should be dead to sin and we should live our lives for Jesus Christ, following his example, following his life, living for him. And uh, we also see one of these elements of these false teachers in Jude Chapter 1 is, first of all, they are ungodly people who pervert the grace of our Lord into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign Lord. He says, our only sovereign Lord. That means a lot of false teachers will maybe advocate for other ways to God. Meaning, they'll say, well, there's more than one way to get to heaven. When Jesus clearly taught, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. So you can know that you're dealing with a false teacher if they advocate other ways to be reconciled to God or be forgiven of our sins other than Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ made it clear. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. The Bible clearly teaches that Jesus Christ is our source of peace before God. He is the source of our forgiveness, our reconciliation, and he is the only sacrifice, biblically, that God has provided to forgive our sins. And so we see these false teachers deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign Lord. And so they also deny it through their lifestyle. Because we see in one of Paul's letters, he talks about... Uh, they claim to know God, but their actions, in their actions, they deny Him. And, uh, you know, and so a lifestyle of a person can tell a lot about where they are at in their relationship with God. Another thing we're going to look at is 2 Timothy verses, I mean, 1 Timothy verse six, uh, chapter 6. These are the things you are to teach. And insist on. If anyone teaches otherwise and does not agree with the sound instructions of the Lord Jesus Christ and godly teaching, they are conceited and understand nothing. They have an unhealthy interest in controversies and quarrels about words that result in envy and strife and malicious talk, evil suspicions, and constant frictions between people of corrupt minds who have been robbed of the truth, who think that godliness is a means for financial gain. 
Nowhere in Scripture can we support the idea that <clears throat> that if you serve and follow Christ, you're going to strike it wealthy. Spiritually, we can be wealthy spiritually. We can have an abundant life, as Jesus talked about in John 10, 10, where he says, I have come to give you life and life to the abundance. But that does not mean riches in the monetary sense. God never promised any of us that we would get rich following Jesus Christ. And one element of a false teacher is they teach that, you know, serving God means wealth, health, and prosperity. And what I mean by that is we, ain't, we are not always going to have health. We aren't always, we won't, we aren't guaranteed wealth. And we're not guaranteed really prosperous prosperity either. We will go through hard times as Christians. We will go through trials. We will go through tribulations. Jesus even warned. Uh, in this world, you will have troubles, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So, obviously we see life is not just going to be easy following Christ. It's not always going to be seemingly prosperous. It's not always going to feel awesome doing the right thing, it's not always going to bring an immediate reward. We will have prosperity in heaven. We will have eternal life. We will have eternal happiness to look forward to. But to, to automatically say we will get that kind of stuff now in this life, that's false teaching. I mean, there is benefit to following Jesus Christ. We can have an overflow of joy. We can have peace. And there will be times where God blesses us in ways we did not expect. Okay, that's okay. But, but to suggest that following Christ means we'll strike it rich, that is a dangerous teaching. Because, you know, uh, it says even in the Proverbs, better a poor man whose walk is blameless than a rich man whose ways are perverse. And so we obviously see there were people, but in the Bible, in the Scripture who were poor, yet they were blameless. They honored God and lived for him, yet they were poor. And so, our financial status has nothing, nothing, and I'll repeat, nothing to do with where we are at in our relationship with God. Uh, for God, Jesus even rebuked the Pharisees. He's like, you are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of men, but God knows your hearts, for what is highly valued in the eyes of God of men is detestable in the sight of God. So the Pharisees thought they were blessed of God because they were rich and wealthy. But Jesus knew that they had a heart problem. Jesus knew they were sinners even though they pretended to be self-righteous. And so what is truly more most important is where we stand with our relationship with God and if we're in close relationship with him then we are truly rich not in the monetary sense per se but we are truly rich in the spiritual sense we see in revelations where God rebukes the church of Laodicea he says I counsel you to buy gold from me refined by the fire meaning true spiritual riches and so Laodicea was a wealthy, prosperous city. And there was a church there, the Laodicean church, and they thought that they were... Let's just turn to that real quick. Let's read it from the text. Let's just make sure we have a clear understanding of what the Scripture actually says. Because that is very important. I don't want to quote, quote things from just my memory, but I want to make sure I'm quoting it correctly. So we'll go to Revelations chapter 2. I believe it is. Might be chapter 3. Let's just take a look-see. Okay. Let's just take a look. We got the Church of Ephesus, the Church of Smyrna, the Church of Pergamum, the Church of Thyatira. We got the Church of Sardis, Philadelphia. Okay, last Laodicea. To the angel in the church of Laodicea, right, these are the words of the amen, the amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say I am rich, I have acquired wealth, and I do not need a thing. 
but you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich and white clothes to wear so that you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Those who I love I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. So we see this church had become prosperous in the material sense, but they still needed to repent of some things that were making them poor. Uh, let's see. Poor, pitiful, blind, and naked, and wretched. So, if our spiritual life's not healthy, it doesn't matter how much wealth we actually have materially, it doesn't matter. That will all rot in the end. And so, we see actually in the church of Smyrna, we have a different scenario. These were poor Christians, poor believers, but they were exceedingly commended by God. To the angel in the church of Smyrna, right? These are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and is came to life again. I know your afflictions. I know about the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison and test you, and you will suffer persecution for ten days. Be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you you life as a victor's crown. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, the one who is victorious will not be hurt by the second death. Okay, and then we have the church of Philadelphia, also a church that wasn't rich and affluential per se, but they had become rich in the things of God. So, let's take a look. To the angel in the church of Philadelphia write, These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens no one can shut, and what he shuts no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and not denied my name. I will make those who are of a synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Since you have kept my command, endured patiently, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. And so we see, we see it doesn't always mean we are close to God. If we're if we are experience happy times in life, prosperous times in life, we should thank God for that. But, we shouldn't automatically assume, if we're going through hard trials and crises and persecutions and afflictions, we should not determine by that that we are far away from God. Actually, we may be walking closer to God, and that may be evidence. Persecutions are often evidence that we are doing the Christian life correctly. Because if we're just passively going through, and we're not really making much of an effort, no one is going to bother us, really. You know, uh, the only time people get bothered in the Christian life is when they're actually really passionately standing for it. You know, but if someone's just quiet about their faith and just sails through, you know, nobody's going to know that. You know, so, so basically... It's a false teaching to suggest that, you know, and this was a common belief in Jesus' time, too. The people thought that if you were wealthy, God's blessing was on your life, but if you were poor, God's curse was on your life. And that's just not true. We see that throughout Scripture that that's just not true. There were godly wealthy people in the Bible. Of course, we see that. But then there were also godly poor people. And so... What we do with what we have and how we serve the Lord with what we got is what truly matters. How close we are to Him from a spiritual standpoint is what truly matters. And if we have yet to, if you have, if whoever's listening, if you have yet to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you still need to lay hold of true riches right there, for He is the source of life and fulfillment and true abundance in life. It's not going to be easy following Christ, but it's certainly worth it every time. God bless.